Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Beatles News Brief Extra. I'm your host Steve Marinucci and this edition is dated November 29th, 2018. Here's a little bit of news. Uh, Paul McCartney's Freshen Up Tour is back on the road. Last night he was in Nanterre, France at the Paris La Défense Arena. Sorry for the French. The set list as usual was basically the same. He took out All My Love in, in the third spot and added in Can't Buy Me Love. He added Michelle in the number 17 spot and took out Eleanor Rigby four songs later. And now on today's extra, Beatleness author Candy Leonard and myself talk a little bit about George Harrison and the impression he left during the Beatle years. November 29th, of course, is the anniversary of the day of his passing. So take a listen. We're here to celebrate the music and accomplishments of George Harrison, and I'm here with contributing ed- editor Candy Leonard. Hello, Candy. Hey, Steve. How you doing? All right. Um, and it, you know, it, it when you look back at his life, and we're talking, you know, the early days of the Beatles, starting with the early days of the Beatles, the pre-Beatlemania days. It was evident even then that there was something special there. When you look at, for example, his work, you know, the songs he sang in the BBC sessions, and even on the Hamburg tapes, you know, there was kind, of, there was a, there was something very special there. All right. Well, he, you know, like the others, he had that deep love for rock and roll, and he also, uh, you know, he he pushed himself to learn how to play the guitar. He worked really, really hard in those early days, um, and I guess it paid off. Um, well, that was that was one of the things that you really <laughs> noticed on those early Beatle records is his love of Scotty Moore and and you know all those early guitar Carl Perkins, of course. Uh, and and how not only um, how much he emulated them, but how good he developed on his own. He took that he took that knowledge and and really made a, a his own style out of it. Yeah, he did, and of course, then later on when he got the twelve string, he basically created a new sound for the. Mo- I mean that that was emulated by so many others after him. Mm-hmm. His, his, he's he's got a. I mean, his legacy has several different tentacles. You know, there's obviously the Beatles legacy just in general, and then there's the, you know, as a guitar. I don't know. Do we call him a virtuoso or not? I don't really know how that. I I, I think you, I think you can. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. because I mean it, because later on he he was such you know he developed. It, um, even well, even during the Beatle years, he developed, you know, little bits of things that made him unique, that made his sound unique. Uh, yeah. So I think I think you can you can say that. I mean, obviously, during the later years, be, when he you know when he did his solo stuff, there was more there, and he was allowed to do more. But even during the Beatle years, it was there. You know. Right. He would he he would put you know these these little flourishes that these little accents these little exactly exactly that, exactly that, that were like I'm thinking of the one on she loves you that comes in I think on the third chorus or something mm-hmm. it's these little what I call splendid flourishes that he he was really the master of. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean yeah, of course he was referred to as the quiet one. Um, but which, you know, really which wasn't which wasn't quiet. always true. No, he really was. I mean, you know, he, he's you know functioning in the shadow of John and Paul, so that kind of you know restrained him in some ways, certainly musically, and and you know maybe at, even at some of the uh, early press conferences, whatever. But when he spoke up, boy, he he was he was metaphorically loud. You know, what I mean, he he would say he was very funny. He had an incredible sense of humor, very dry sense of humor. That wonderful Scouse accent, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, he he always he always seemed like slightly annoyed, which is I think part of his charm. I'm thinking of one instance where he was very annoyed was that night at. Um 
I can't remember the uh, the nightclub where he tossed the water into the reporter's face. <laughs> you remember that? No, I don't. Oh, really? Yeah, and I can't remember. Unfortunately, I can't remember which nightclub it was off the top of my head. I could I could look it up here, and I'm not going to do it right now. But there was one. Uh, it was in Hollywood. I think it was Whiskey a Go Go. Mm-hmm. Where they were, and I think that was the night Jane Mansfield was with them, and he, and he, they kept he, they kept telling the reporters to to back off, and and one specifically, I don't know if it was one or or all of them, but they wouldn't, and of course, and George took a glass of water and tossed it at him, and there's a picture of him doing that, and you can see the scowl on his face. He is yeah. he is angry. He yeah. is not, you know. And that's not something, you know, Paul didn't do that, or at least Paul wasn't photographed doing that. I mean, John, we all know that John reacted, how John reacted to certain situations, and that he was not always restrained. But this was one time that George was not restrained either. But that's neither, I mean, that's just a... Uh, a minor, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that up. I mean, in the total picture, though, he was, he was very, he was, you know, his, he had a sweet personality, and that's what, what carries today. I mean, even, even now, people, you know, refer to that, uh, you know, how it, and how it developed from the Beatle years to the later years, you know. Um, well, I'm thinking, you know, when, when fans first were introduce you know when, when we met the Beatles as it were um you know there he was like thinking about even back to the Ed Sullivan show he kind of you know he moves back and forth you know between John and Paul and he's kind of you know which was sort of metaphorical for how it kind of was in a way and uh you know he this this electricity between all of them the knowing looks you know the three of them up there it was and he this striking image like he was so skinny right and mm-hmm. tall and, and he 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 um he was quite a presence you know and then I wanted to say too in a hard day's night when we really got to see them you know on the big screen and in that his role, I mean, the, his lines in that movie and the his persona in that movie are just wonderful. I mean, so oh, sharp. Ab- absolutely, absolutely. So uh, iconoclastic and, um, you know, yeah, he, he was a great, very strong presence. Well, the one, the one scene in the, in the office there about Susan, and that was... That was pure genius, uh, you know. And uh, I mean, he he acted. Everybody comes out of that movie talking about Ringo's acting. Of course, Ringo was a great actor. Uh, I mean, he went on to do several films on his own. But George, in that that one scene, was just in, amazing. I mean, that was that's the one one of the you know scenes that you come back to now, just over and over and over again. Yeah. And also in, I mean, the, one of the other, well, I, again, to overuse the word iconic, um, iconic scenes from that film when they're playing on the, um, on the, on the field during Can't Buy Me Love, and of course, at the end, when, uh, you know, the guy comes to private property, and it's, and it's George, he delivers a very brief, but hugely important line. Where he says, "Sorry, we hurt your field, Mister." Right. Yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not Ringo. It's not John. It's not Paul. It's George that says that. Yeah. So. so just this commentary, you know. Yeah. He he um he brought to them a certain sensibility that is really hard to imagine them without. Which I guess that's kind of in, in some ways a a silly thing to say but if we focus yeah, I mean because you could say that about all of them but mm-hmm. he um, you know certainly later with the Eastern uh, philosophy and and, relig- and re- his interest in um, Eastern religion all that and of course music but he, he also brought a kind of he, he was he was very philosophical you know he, he was a ph- well they all in some sense again were but he he had a particular sensibility about things that I think was very uh, it was unique definitely mm-hmm. unique. when you studied when you did the, the your study of Beatle fans for Beatleness how did you find George fans as opposed to 
St. Paul fans? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, I did talk about the whole issue of picking a favorite and why that was an important thing to do, but I don't remember offhand if I asked, like, why is George your favorite? You know, that kind of thing, which I think might be what you're getting at. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, well, I would say I can speak for myself now because I now have gone full circle and he's now my favorite Beatle. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, I just, I should say too, like, I hate that question when people say, who's your favorite Beatle? Um, <laughs> the answer is, because it's just kind of ridiculous, because you can't have, you know, it's like four sides of a, four angle, right angles on a square, you know, it's like, which is your favorite right True. on this square? Well, if you take and, away, it doesn't mean anything. Well, and, and also too, <laughs> what generally happens is that Ringo gets kind of bumped out of there, and that's, I'm, it's kind of good that that's not happening much, right. as much as it used to. Well, it's funny that you say about Ringo because when I was, you know, at, at eight years old, when I had an opportunity to get a Remco doll, I wanted Ringo. I Ringo was my first favorite Beatle, and I <laughs> and I think it was because of what I was just describing. How the three of them are out front. He's off in the back. He seems sort of neglected, and he you no, know, he was like the underdog somehow. He was, and of course. A hard day's night, you know, added to that impression. Um, then I was a, then I was a Paul, you know. Then it was Paul, and then it was John. I mean, in some ways, I still think of like John. It's almost like a thing apart. Like John is larger than life, and George is sort of life. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. That, no, that's it. That's actually a very, that's a very astute. Um, observation, but then then comes the question: Where does where does Paul fit? Where does Ringo fit? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, again, I mean, it's just so hard to imagine it with any any different cast of characters. I mean, George George grew so. I mean, they all grew, obviously, but George grew, I think, in an additional way because he had the added burden of being in the shadow of two geniuses mm-hmm. who are very confident and into their own dynamic and their own, you know, thing. And he really had to, and of course, even the art, you know, how he was the younger one and he tagged along. And John said in later years, it took him a long time to see George as an equal and all that. So for, jo- for George to have thrived as he did in that environment, um, you know, speaks to his determination and his um, drive to express himself as an artist. What do you think is is George's be- best lyric, uh, Candy? I think his best lyric is, you still have time to rectify all the things. Well, let me say the whole thing. The future still looks good, and you have time to rectify all the things that you should. I mean, those are words to live by. I think my favorite lyric would be it's all too much it's all too much for me to take the love that's shining all around you everywhere it's what you make for us to take it's all too much I think that sums up everything pretty nicely a look back in history on November 29th 1963 I Wanna Hold Your Hand was released in the UK it was released to advance orders of a million records and that was the first time that it happened on November 29, 1969, the single Come Together hit number one in the U.S., and on November 29, 1980, John and Yoko released the Double Fantasy album. On November 30, 1963, With the Beatles became the first million-selling album by a group in the U.K. A happy birthday on November 29th to former Ringo All-Star Felix Cavalieri. Happy birthday, November 30th, to Frank Ifield, who sang I Remember You, that was covered by the Beatles in Hamburg, and also shared an album with them on VJ Records. Also born on November 30th, Alan Sherman, who sang Pop Hates the Beatles, and Dick Clark, the host of American Bandstand. Thanks to everyone for for listening. You can hear us in back-to-back blocks on the great Fab Four radio, and individually where you get our podcasts. Send your comments to BeatlesNewsDesk at gmail.com or leave them on YouTube or iTunes. And please join our Beatles News and Information group on Facebook where we post news as it happens. And also take a look at our That's What I Want Beatles store for links to Beatles stuff that you might be interested in. And please subscribe to the show and share it. We'd appreciate it. Until next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying... Be seeing you.
keep that one. Market fab.